Uh, thanks everyone for joining us for this evening's event. My name is Kevin. I'm one of the event hosts here at Powell's Books. And before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at powells.com. And if you don't already do so, please follow us on the social medias, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, as well as our YouTube channel. Tonight, we're very excited to welcome Robin George Andrews in conversation with Steve Olson. Volcanoes are capable of acts of pyrotechnical prowess verging on magic. They spout black magma more fluid than water, create shimmering cities of glass at the bottom of the ocean, and frozen lakes of lava on the moon, and can even tip entire planets over. Between lava that melts and reforms the landscape and noxious volcanic gases that poison the atmosphere, volcanoes have threatened life on Earth countless times in our planet's history. Yet despite their reputation for destruction, volcanoes are inseparable from the creation of our planet. A lively and utterly fascinating guide to these geologic wonders, super volcanoes revels in the incomparable power of volcanic eruptions, past and present, earthbound and otherwise, and recounts the daring and sometimes death-defying careers of the scientists who study them. Science writer Robin George Andrews explores how these eruptions reveal secrets about the worlds to which they belong, describing the stunning ways in which volcanoes can sculpt the sea, land, and sky, and even influence the machinery that makes or breaks this existence of life. He joins us tonight from London, England. Andrews will be joined in conversation by Steve Olson, author of The Apocalypse Factory, Plutonium and the Making of the Atomic Age, which comes out in paperback next month. He's also the author of Eruption, the Untold Story of Mount St. Helens, which won a Washington State Book Award. His writing has appeared in Science Magazine, The Atlantic, Smithsonian, and other mm -hmm. publications. We thank him for being part of tonight's event. He's joining us from Seattle, Washington. This evening's event includes an audience Q&A. Please use that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question at any time. And if someone has typed a question that you'd also like to know the answer to, you can upvote that particular question by clicking the thumbs up button. Most importantly, please support Robin and Powell's by purchasing a copy of his book from us a link to buy super volcanoes, as well as a link to buy Steve's books, will be shared in the chat a couple of times this evening. Robin, Steve, we're thrilled to welcome you both this evening. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Kevin. Say, so, Robin, I wanted to ask you, uh, first of all, about the Powell's connection in your book, because it's obvious that there is one. You, mm -hmm. you uh, describe a volcanologist who uh, said that she went to the world's greatest bookstore in Portland, and everyone here in the Pacific Northwest knows that that has to be Powell's. So uh, maybe you can tell us, start out by telling us about her. Absolutely, yeah. So um, uh, Jackie, Jackie Kaplan Auerbach is one of my favorite scientists to talk to because she's always so endlessly enthusiastic in that way that, you know, you kind of want, like, you, you, hope, you hope that that's her sort of person that would give lectures to you at university sort of thing, just gesticulating wildly and everything like that. And like a lot of volcanologists, she was kind of inspired by the sort of the sort of awe and terror of the 1980 Mount St. Helens kind of paroxysm. Um, but um, it took, it's, it's one of those wonderful stories where someone didn't immediately go, ah, yes, I obviously want to be a volcanologist sort of thing. It was just a part of it. And um, she always uh, had this kind of inkling for science, but she told me that she didn't really the, the, the kind of school she went to, it didn't really kind of encourage her to do it. It, it was kind of, she kind of felt outmatched uh, for a while. Um, but then um, she went to Powell's and saw a book uh, called Physical Oceanography. And she she couldn't believe that you could have physics of the ocean. Like it combined two of our loves, like physics and the ocean. So this book, you know, was devoured and it really helped kind of spur her on to actually, you know, uh, just end up, you know, in a 20s cold calling graduate programs to ask like, hey, I want to do this. I, I love physics. I love the ocean. <laughs> you got to give me something to do on this. Uh, and she eventually found a supervisor, you know, putting seismometers on a underwater Hawaiian uh, volcano sort of thing. So it's kind of nice that, that Powell's kind of 
inspired it with that uh with, with a moment of uh you know who'd have thought physical oceanography right not not necessarily an evocative pairing of words but... the physical, physical oceanography section was my guess yeah <laughs> yeah but um uh you know it's just it's just always nice when someone comes to that, that moment where they're like this is it this is the thing no that's absolutely it so turns out a book on physical oceanography who'd have thought it you know, the other interesting thing was that she was one of a, uh, of several people that you interview in your book who were influenced by the eruption of Mount St. Helens. Maybe it was just the, something that, uh, that was at the right time, but uh, I was surprised at the influence of that eruption on the field in that so many people cite Mount St. Helens as being sort of the formative experience in their lives, their professional mm -hmm. lives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of an odd thing, isn't it? Because it's, it's so, it, it was a moment of sheer horror and terror at the time, but there is also something undeniably impressive about the fact that a mountain can essentially self-destruct <laughs> in a way uh, and that, that makes people feel small but in a way that's actually kind of spurs you on it doesn't make it makes you feel insignificant in that perspective shifting way rather than in that like you know oh well I have no effect on everything it's it's nice that some people can get feel small in the face of something like an eruption and then want to do something about that you know it's it's uh it's and yeah, and it seems that plenty of volcanologists, whether they're in America or they were around the world, you know, it comes up countless times. I love asking people, "How did you get into this field?" The amount of people that say they Mount St. Helens, either they were there or they climbed it later, or they saw like photographs in National Geographic. Um, you know, one of the volcanologists working on the Spain eruption at the moment and and La Palma said that he got into volcanology because he saw photographs of the aftermath of Mount St. Helens, and he said that I wanted to do something to stop that kind of ruin somehow, you know, and he was 14 growing up in Greece. So yeah, it's got, it was, it's a global thing that, that eruption, so. Well, how'd you, how'd you get into it in that case? Because, you know, here in the Pacific <laughs> Northwest, we can look outside our windows and there's those volcanoes. I can see two of them from where I'm living here in Seattle and almost everyone else can, but uh, not many volcanoes in England. Uh, so, uh, so what led you to this, uh, this field? Yeah, so I am, um, so when I was when I was very very young, like uh, four or five, I initially wanted to go into something about space. I mean, space is obviously inspirational for a lot of people and kids and things. And I initially wanted to do something on on the stars because someone I can't remember if someone told me or I read it in a book. I think I read it in a, like a picture book kind of thing that stars die. Uh, and I thought that's crazy. I don't understand how this this permanent looking wallpaper for a planet could could change like that. But it kind of transpired that it maybe would be a bit impossible for me to go and visit these <laughs> or even other planets sort of thing. I don't know how I kind of came across that early on in childhood, but I was like, mm, I don't think I'm going to manage to get to these places. So I kind of wanted something more tangible. And so I am a big video game fan, still am. And I was playing a game called uh, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, which is obviously one of the best games ever made. But in it, there's a, <laughs> there's a volcano called Death Mountain, um which is nothing like a volcano in real life it's like really hollow on the inside and there are monsters and things at least it's not what i think volcanoes are like on the inside uh and you know you've got this like strange sentient lava and you have to solve puzzles and things and it, it's great i mean this game was inspired by the guy who made it uh it was inspired by his wanderings around kyoto in japan so it was like his childhood imagination put into a game so you really felt that like expansive uh wonder to it and it was one of the first true like 3d games and everything so it really had an impact on me as a 10 year old and i was like whoa what is this death mountain volcano and i i obviously saying there aren't many volcanoes in the uk um not really <laughs> not ones that erupt or anything like that they're just very very old and very very dead um so i kind of googled it and uh that with a combination of some very encouraging geography teachers i was just absolutely enthralled by the fact that there are volcanoes all over the world so it kind of occurred to me that a I could get to go all over the world seeing these things and b it seemed like someone must do this as a job <laughs> like I don't know why but someone must do it people have a job for anything so surely someone has a job in volcanoes and yeah I had no more logic it was just persistence and stubbornness at that point like I'm doing something on volcanoes and I just treated everything up, up to that up to the point of me writing this book as like you know, in service of that childhood stubbornness. <laughs> well, yeah, so an argument for uh, for parents letting their kids play video games, I guess, that they can lead in, in professional directions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like everything, there are good video games and terrible ones. So, you know, um, so The Legend of Zelda is a great series. <laughs> you should always play that. So when did you actually get to, to see a volcano then? What was your first one? Uh, my first, my first one, hmm. 
Uh, one of the first active ones I saw was Sakurajima in Japan, and I love Sakurajima because it's it's like I love Japan anyway um, for many reasons, but Sakurajima's uh, name means Cherry Blossom Island, and it's not an island nowadays, which is kind of it, I, was, I was a bit weirded out by. But it turns out that about a hundred years ago, this volcano, which was an island, erupted so furiously that it created its own land bridge with the rest of the country, sort of thing. So I was just so amazed by how powerful and yet sort of magical that was <laughs> but also it erupts like you know several times a week so it's a really good place to go and see that kind of quite like fairly explosive kind of um effervescence but I, but i guess um i think the first volcano i i ever saw uh, was maybe etna um in italy just because it's absolutely gigantic and i was there with my um parents when I was younger and it was it's just like a colossus you know it's so big that you don't even really know you're on it kind of thing in a way and I think I was always impressed by the sheer scale of volcanoes you know I get I like that feeling of feeling small in the face of nature kind of thing because it's humbling but it's also quite exciting so but yeah I've taken any opportunity to see as many as I can since so <laughs> you know uh, keep them coming so yeah, you describe uh, you know sort of one of your favorites in Italy as well just because of the display that it always puts on uh, which is something that doesn't really happen here in the Pacific Northwest. Our, our volcanoes erupt and then are quiet for a long time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, that's the thing. It's, uh, I think, volcanoes. I, I think that's why they kind of have some of the, like sometimes they have a sinister reputation, just because you have these volcanoes that are just sitting there. People know are, are highly active and um, and will erupt at, at some point one day, sort of thing. But I don't know. Like they're just so beautiful anyway, um, and it's. It's, they're just very beguiling. I mean, that's why I was really drawn to Mount Fuji in Japan, apart from the fact that it's this absolutely beautiful part of the landscape. It's, it's it, it will explosively erupt again at some day, but at the moment, it's just this frozen throne of lava that you can kind of ascend and climb around sort of thing and like see, see shooting stars at the top. And yeah, I think they're beguiling whether they're erupting or not, you know. Um, I just think they're Earth's sort of architectural wonders. Yeah, so where did you make the transition from? I mean, you set out to study volcanoes. You wanted yeah. to do that, and and now you're writing about them. So right. yeah, that's a that's a that's a different approach to volcanoes. It, yeah, I so it turns I'm quite an impatient person. I quite like doing many things rather than just focusing on one thing. <laughs> but because maybe because of my love of video games, I treat everything with like a video game logic. So I was like, well, I like volcanoes. So what's the what's the ultimate end goal of uh, <laughs> of this this video game of life sort of thing? I was like, well, I. I want to be a doctor of volcanoes, A, because it sounds ridiculous, but um, B, because I just obviously love volcanoes and academia seems like the right way to go. So I, I did everything in the pursuit of that and, you know, did um, part of my, uh, 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 my undergrad degree in London and then Vancouver and then I went to New Zealand to do the PhD and it was great. Like it was great fun pursuing that goal. But um, as much as I enjoy jumping about and all over the world sort of thing, um, academia is quite a tough, uh sometimes quite isolating experience sort of thing uh and it's just, it just it just occurred to me during the phd that you have to just constantly apply for funding and jump around and it's not really sure where you'll end up at all um and i you know there's one thing one thing to travel everywhere but there's one thing to like well where do i actually want to live kind of thing and i i kind of didn't want to lose that all control over that sort of thing and it turns out at the time i quite enjoyed telling people about volcanoes and i loved like showing my parents um, um, this volcano called Stromboli in in Italy, which again is like hyperactive. It shoots lava into the sky. You know, uh, it used to be several times a day. Now it's a bit slower because it exploded briefly at one point. But yeah, in the middle of the PhD, I met them in Italy and showed them this like wondrous volcano, this really genuinely beautiful like island that that you know the, it's called the Lighthouse of the Mediterranean. So it lights up the sea, and they were so that was the first time that my parents had ever seen an eruption. <clears throat> and it kind of I could see that they were so like wowed by it you know it's, there's one thing to tell someone about it one thing to see it and I just felt like oh I wanted to communicate that or to as many people as possible um because you know why wouldn't I <laughs> so it, it kind of occurred to me that maybe I should try science writing so I just did what any <laughs> willing science writer did and just cold cool editors with like this thing you're writing on volcanoes is silly you should write about this thing instead and eventually I got given enough shots and didn't mess, and mess them up. And yeah, ended up writing a, a book on it, which I still can't believe. Um, but it's, uh, you know, I don't know what I would do other than 
write about volcanoes and planets and things. I don't think I'm good at anything else to do it. <laughs> it is faster than science. It, it takes a long time to write a book, but uh, gosh, mm. it takes so long to get a scientific study done that that makes uh, book writing look fast by comparison. Yeah, and, and, and the language is just more is so much more interesting to me than the kind of I get why journals have to be quite dry and t clinical, but you know I was told off a lot for using flowery language in in the journal articles I was writing, and I was like, mm, maybe I want to do something where I can use that kind of language, that creative language. <clears throat> so yeah, I, I I I regret nothing, as they say. You know, I said that we don't have uh, volcanoes in the Pacific Northwest that are active here all the time, but of course we do have one pretty near in the United States, and mm -hmm. that's at Kilauea. And you talk mm -hmm. quite a bit about that, that volcano there. So, it, I mean, you have a whole chapter about it. And it sounds like uh, that experience was interesting to go to Hawaii and, and learn about that volcano. And it is an, an amazing place. I've been there myself uh, to tour it, although it was not active when I was there. It sounds like you might have been there when it was active. Yeah, so Kilauea is one of these things that sort of, <clears throat> it's kind of extraordinary that it, it exists i was already wowed by the fact that you have a 35 year long eruption of some sort you know which is such an extraordinary when, when, when it's beyond like a generation of human time scales i mean like when that first started erupting in 1983 well it'd been erupting many for a thousand years but when the when the 35 year long eruption started you know the return of the jedi just came out in cinemas and and uh you know it was in the middle of like that another uptick in the cold war and then by the time it this eruption ended with this grand finale in 2018 you know, the world is a very different place, but this volcano had just been doing its usual thing. So apart from the fact that it had, it had this like continual presence in a way that, you know, other volcanoes didn't, I think it was the effect that it had on volcanologists that really interests me and that they have this like emotional paradox of being flown around from the world and the country and seeing like these lava fountains, this extraordinary kind of magic uh, happen and, and actually feel like moments of joy, but also at the same time feel moments of horror because of how destructive it was no one died during this eruption but it was like the perfect eruption to be like well they're creative and destructive simultaneously there aren't many things that do that um and i think it was just so beguiling and you know i i, I don't know i don't know how i could have started the book without talking about Kilauea. really you know it was so recent um that eruption as well and it, as we've seen in the news well, it's 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 woken up again very recently and it's uh it's it's uh it's not resting it, it doesn't it's not a lazy volcano <laughs> Yeah, you wrote that you wanted to repair the, the reputations of volcanoes, that they had a bad reputation. You thought that maybe you could give them, um, um, a, a certain, try to rectify that a little bit. Yeah. And, and I guess Kilauea, I mean, Kilauea did do a lot of damage. It didn't kill anybody. Mm. So tell us about the positive sides of volcanoes. Why, why should we look at an event like that and say, this is, this is a good thing ultimately for the Earth? Yeah, so, I mean, the thing is, we, we kind of make the hazards by being in the way of certain volcanoes sort of thing. And obviously the best way to mitigate that hazard is to better understand the volcanoes. But I just think they, they do things that nothing else really does. So it, on one level, it's just the kind of the sheer visual splendor of what they can do. I mean, I couldn't believe it when someone showed me footage of, of uh, a lava well, which is basically like a tiny spinning tornado of, of lava. And, you know, it's just whipped up in the same way that kind of uh, any of these kind of firewalls you see are like you know any of these kind of wildfires kind of shows up it's just a spinning vortex but this time you have lava just being flung out of it sort of thing and I was like what and obviously people started going oh well it's obviously a lava nado and the USGS were like no we don't call it that we call it a firewall and I'm like okay you call it that well do you call it in the field when no one is listening and they went yeah we call it a lava nado I'm like of course you do because it's this is crazy that you can see this kind of stuff you have like blue fire kind of appearing you have these giant rivers of lava where you have like apartment sized blocks shifting down it you know the roar of the jet engine there's these lava fountains these kind of billowing clouds i mean you can there's like i think it's the fact that you can't do anything about it so you have to kind of admire its ability to kind of produce these sort of supernatural like displays you know there isn't really anything quite like that really i think so even on, on that level there's that but also the fact that volcanoes do something that again nothing else does and they literally dig up the insides of the planet so you can actually they, they, they are they they dig up buried treasure and you know we can kind of image the inside of planets with seismic waves and things like that but to actually get the stuff that they're made of from the inside tells you why worlds are made why worlds die out why worlds thrive they help you answer existential questions so it's it's one part they just are amazing they have the definition of kind of well that's cool
but they're also scientifically very profound to the point where you can answer existential questions with them. And again, I can't think of anything else that does that, not just on Earth, but in the in the yeah. universe, really. So. Yeah, no, I, I want to ask you about some of your uh, the volcanoes elsewhere in the solar system, mm -hmm. because th that was some of the, the material that I didn't know uh, all that well from the book. But first of all, I have to ask you about Yellowstone. I talk a little bit about mm -hmm. Yellowstone in my book about Mount St. Helens uh, yeah. in that uh, and, and in sort of a jokey way that if uh, Yellowstone were to erupt, as long as the wind were blowing the right way, only the eastern two thirds of the United <laughs> States would be destroyed. The problem being then that all those people <laughs> in the eastern two thirds of the United States would move to the west coast and uh and and we, we definitely don't want that to happen oh no yeah um so um but you you have a chapter about yellowstone in which you talk about the fact that we you know when you have a, a, a an alert a news alert on the mm. web about yellowstone as you probably do as do i almost every day you get a, a notices about various uh newspapers some in rather sketchy places writing about how yellowstone is about to erupt and uh, destroy at least the united states if not mm -hmm. uh, a good portion of north america uh, it sounds like that's something that we probably don't have to worry about so much but why not uh, i mean should we worry or at least yeah, so this people in wyoming think, worry yeah so this is one of the things it's, it's been bigged up by i think in part by really sketchy british tabloids again for some really weird reason and oh, we don't um, have any of those here <laughs> oh, the, the internet makes these things travel. Yeah, it's a bit like the news, the way that people get the news from, like this Daily Express, and you get, I don't know why, but anyway, um, they're obsessed, obsessed with that and the fact that an asteroid, oh, is approaching Earth and it always misses this sort of thing. And they, every day there's some story on this stuff. Anyway, but that and a, and, a, and a kind of a couple of sensationist kind of documentaries, I think really cemented the idea that, you know, when you have a, a super volcano, which generally, which in very basic terms is just a volcano that is capable of erupting a massive amount of, you know, volcanic material on go. I mean, you know, or has at some point in its past, it does sound kind of ominous, but it's it's just taken on a life of its own. I mean, Yellowstone is just such a beautiful place. I mean, you know, the reason you have this, this tapestry of kind of geologic wonders, nat natural wonders is because you have a volcanic system that's kind of there, but it's, it's it's not like it's not um america's world ending you know <laughs> button kind of thing world ending patch it's 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 not a, a weapon of mass destruction no way the, the thing with super volcanoes is all we need to do to be keep, be called a super volcano is erupt cat cataclysmically in a way once in your entire lifetime and these volcanoes exist for millions of years millions of years way beyond human you know the existence of the human species sort of thing so yeah Yellowstone has had two of these eruptions there's been one fairly big one um but th that's the thing about super volcanoes that they're a bit like olympic athletes in the sense that they can get a gold medal once or twice maybe but then they usually retire i mean there's there's a very 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 small chance you can have another epic eruption at Yellowstone at some point but we'd have weeks and months of warning because something that big would make a lot of noise um but at the same time like it it's much more likely to do what it's done for most of its life. And that's, you know, erupt some lava at some point or have a little kind of steam based explosion, which is yeah, still dangerous to people in the park. But, you know, we're not talking about any world ending apocalypse here. You know, that humanity has lived through one of these super eruptions before in um, uh, Toba. And, uh, you know, there was no technology back then. And yes, it would have been very unpleasant to live right next to this uh, eruption. But all the evidence to date suggests that humanity did just fine away from it you know it might have dusted everything in ash for a little bit it would have been quite inconvenient but you know it's 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 not it's it's not the fearful doom um canon that everyone kind of oh, like, like these alerts make it out to be kind of thing you know i just realized uh, that you call it, your, your the name of your book is super volcanoes mm -hmm. uh, people may think that that is um a bit of marketing by a, a publishing house but the fact of the matter is that these this is a term volcanologists use to, to describe these very large volcanoes so it's a it's a perfectly legitimate term and an appropriate one to use for this book i, I assume yeah no it is and that's the thing i so i know scientists like some don't mind it but you know mike poland who's, a, who's the head of the yellowstone volcano observatory who i love talking to again he's one of the loveliest people he hates the term super volcanoes because it again it gets misused so much. Yeah. Like he hates it in the way that a lot of people hate coriander. It just gives that instant like oh, kind of reaction sort of thing. But there is a, obviously an allure to it because scientists themselves use it in their academic papers. And obviously, turns out that a few scientists are like, ah, oh, it's a good way to get attention uh, if you use a phrase like super volcanoes kind of thing. But it is kind of like it is it is kind of a silly term just because it's a pretty arbitrary line. So like if you're a face of a volcano that was going to erupt 
240 cubic miles of material and you're standing right in front of it. And then you had another volcano that was going to erupt 239 cubic miles of material. The first is a super volcanic eruption, but the second one isn't. Uh, but you wouldn't really care. <laughs> like yeah, the point is, it's it's kind of beyond a beyond a certain point. It doesn't really have any scientific meaning. But I guess it's just that need to put a line under certain things. You know, you have to. It's like what is a planet now? That's why Pluto got demoted because at some point someone went, "Well, we have to define what a planet is." Otherwise, it's just anarchy. So at some point someone went, "This is what a super volcano is." Um, it's at the high end of the scale. So it is a legitimate term. It's not like it's not like it, it is meaningless sort of thing. But it's it definitely has been misconstrued as. This is what this kind of volcano will always do. Whereas in the fact that it's 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 an incredibly rare event. I mean, again, like the fact there's only been one, um, you know, only been kind of like a handful of uh, super volcanic eruptions during humanity's entire existence. So just how, um, like you wouldn't, you shouldn't go day to day worrying about it really. It's not, it's not the sort of thing that you should worry about. And again, people would notice if it started to kick off. <laughs> you, you, they, these are not subtle things. Well, speaking of tabloids, uh, before we talk about uh, volcanoes in space, which uh, was really interested me about this book, we, we yeah. definitely have to talk about underwater volcanoes and other underwater volcanoes that contain sharks. You know, I, I assume <laughs> the show Sharknado has made it to the UK. And so yes. a, a combination of oh, cool. sharks, volcanoes and tornadoes. I mean, I mean, we, we definitely have a pitch that we could bring to Hollywood, I think, with this. So uh, so so tell me about those volcanoes uh, with that have sharks. In them. Yeah. So this is one of the things that sounded sounded ridiculous right it's, it's that one of the things you just think this is obviously stupid what are we talking about <laughs> sharks with volcanoes in them and initially i was like oh okay they meant there's sharks around these volcanoes you know <laughs> no, no 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 there's a volcano called kavachi um in the south pacific which has sharks inside the opening of this volcano and and i was like well, what the hell are they doing there and they're like i don't know we just don't know and it's like see this is the bit of science that interests me most when people like have no idea what is going on but scientists are like, okay, we need to see what's going on. And, you know, I, the, the way that they actually found out that there were sharks in these volcanoes, that they got, they, they got this guy who, who just goes there to fish around these islands and they just went out in this tiny boat with a camera and just chucked it in the mouth of the volcano, like sitting on the, 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 the end of a barrel of a gun and then quickly paddle away. And then when the volcano kind of coughed it back up again, they'd go grab it sort of thing. And, you know, when they looked at the footage, they're like, holy crap the sharks in the, the sharks in the volcano and I, I i just love the fact that no one knows how it works like because the, the this volcano is very explosive it would kill them every time it erupts at this so where do they go i think they want to tag them but it's obviously it's quite hard to do even just put a camera in there so but yeah i guess it really emphasizes that earth is like really a is an ocean planet more than you know a planet with, uh, with land sort of thing and most of it's volcanoes the vast majority is volcanoes are underwater and there's some really alien life forms like hanging about around them and <clears throat> you know like less than one percent of these sort of things so i think i really wanted to write about underwater volcanoes just because it's it's such an unknown compared to the what we you know on land you know it's 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 you might as well be looking on another planet at that point okay other planets so uh first of all before i talk about other planets i, I want to talk about the moon because you have i can't remember this exactly but i think you write in your book about the fact that dinosaurs could have looked up at the moon and actually seen volcanoes erupting. So am I remembering yeah. that correctly? See, if human yeah. beings had lived at the same time as dinosaurs, as some portion of Americans believe, then uh, then they could have done so too. But no, I'm, human beings weren't around at that time. But at least the dinosaurs could have looked up and seen it um, and, and commented on it. No, is that is that true? Would they really have been able to, to see? Yeah. Lava <laughs> erupting on the moon. Wow. Yeah, these kind of these kind of this kind of like glow on the moon, you know, it's it's kind of, I'm really jealous, actually. That yeah, annoys me that we that can't. go in the grand scheme of things. I know, it's, it, it's not really. And it, it's kind of, it is extraordinary. Um, the, 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 you know, the moon is not known for being like a, a volcanic landscape, but humanity's first footsteps on another world in the sea of tranquility on the moon was in a giant frozen sea of lava, which I think is so cool that that's the, you know, that, that we've just decided to, you know, I know it's the nearest celestial body, but all the astronauts that have been there have been bouncing around in like this volcanic mausoleum sort of things that used to be very volcanically active um and um uh everything you kind of see on the surface of the moon is a result of volcanism of some sort and it you know it's as as rocks have been brought back and people have poked them around and studied it it's been clear that the moon has been hotter for longer than people anticipated for something of such a tiny size they thought it should have cooled down and become a corpse by then and is 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 pretty pretty much close to being volcanically dead today i mean it's really on its last legs 
But yeah, there are these weird patches called imps, uh, irregular Mari patches, which are like mini frozen seas of lava. And, you know, scientists have came up, come up with a clever way to kind of work out how old some of them are. And uh, some maybe as young as 50 million years old. So it means that, you know, um, with, with the moon being that close, you know, uh, uh, you know, some of these eruptions might have um, been happening uh, oh, yeah. not only at the same time as the dinosaurs, but after, after they were wiped out. Dinosaurs. So our, our early yeah. mammalian ancestors could have looked up and seen the moon glowing. So yeah, yeah not, well, not, vol not, not volcanoes, but these sort of lava flows, like the ones yeah. we have here in Washington and Portland and, and in Oregon, where uh, the, the, the lava comes out and spreads out over the, over the land and, right. uh, and, and would have been hot enough to be able to be visible from the Earth. Oh yeah, especially because it doesn't really, it has no atmosphere or anything yeah. like that. So you would have seen this just kind of like otherworldly glow in the sky. And I, I just think there's, again, there's something, it's one of those things you hear about and you think, there's no like practical use of that information. It's just magical. And that is just as important to me as anything that has like a practical war. Well, what can we do with that? Like, who cares? There were dinosaurs could have seen eruptions on the moon. You're taking two of the coolest things and it's been like they could see each other. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that, yeah, so as I've been saying, that, that was the surprising thing about your book is that anybody who writes a book about volcanoes learns a lot about volcanoes here on the earth. Mm. But your book, the whole second half is about volcanoes on other planets. And, and mm -hmm. you almost get the impression that it's almost the rule rather than the exception that these various planetary, and in some cases, lunar bodies have these mm -hmm. volcanoes. So, so let's talk about the two nearest planets, Mars and Venus. Um, yeah. The vol volcanoes on Mars, are, do they, would they look a lot like the volcanoes on the Earth or are they different in some way? Uh, well, they, so they're kind of like, the volcanoes on Mars are a bit like the ones you have in Hawaii, these giant sort of shield volcanoes where they're, they are very massive. Um, they're kind of not, not so much like kind of, you know, they're not really like anything like Mount Rainier or anything where it's like pointy kind of volcanoes. They're just broad, flat, massive things. But the thing about Mars is, uh, and that everyone was surprised about, is Mars is a tiny planet compared to Earth and Venus. It's oddly small. It's, it's um, you know, about six of the mass of the Earth and no one's quite sure why that is. And yet a planet that's that small and that thought, you know, surely all its internal heat from its formation, all the radiation should have died out long ago, somehow built the largest volcanoes in the solar system. And not, it's not even close. It's not even like, oh, it's like, oh, it's a kilometer you know, higher than blah, blah, blah. Everyone's heard of Olympus Mons, well, not everyone, but many people have heard of Olympus Mons as the biggest volcano in the solar system. It's about 27 kilometers high. Uh, its base is the same size as Arizona. I mean, that's big, that's a big volcano. But then right next to that, you've got a province called Tharsis, which is basically a giant volcanic pimple that formed on Mars over billions of years. And it and I it's three times the area of the contiguous US, which again, I can't, I can't literally imagine that. It's just unbelievably big. And one of the biggest questions in like planetary science is like, how did a planet so tiny make volcanoes absolutely massive? And do they have a really big impact on the world? You know, they are volcanoes on Earth in, influence so much. That happens day to day. So, what the hell happened on Mars? You know, <laughs> you know, did it change its evolution, sort of thing? So, Mars is weird. Yeah. Yeah, you're right that that volcano was so big it actually tipped Mars over on its side. Makes <laughs> you worry if, the, if that's ever going to happen to the Earth, whether we could ever have such a large volcano that that would that would occur that it would disrupt our orbital. It would take a long. It would take like millions of years. So we'd notice. We'd, we'd sort of, we could chip away at it. So we 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 could you know redistribute the mass. But oh yeah, you know, when someone when, when when I read that paper in twenty. 16 said oh yeah Tharsis grew to be so massive massive that it tipped the planet over by 20 degrees essentially it kind of shifted the, the the top layer of the planet around the middle really kind of thing you know and tipped over it's like um you know I think they said it was like Paris or London suddenly being at the North Pole it had like a huge effect on the planet but yeah most planets get tipped over when something smashes into them but Mars tipped itself over and I just think that was it's crazy, right? <laughs> I don't know how to wrap my head around that. So Venus uh, has a lot of volcanoes as well. And mm -hmm. uh, in, in that case, the volcanoes on Venus, I guess the volcanoes on every planet have a big influence on its atmosphere, but especially on Venus. The volcanoes were one of the reasons that, that, that Venus turned into such of a hellish place. Is that right? Yeah, so Venus is hilariously awful. Like it's, it's the sort of thing that like, if, if someone did believe in like an, uh, a deity that created the universe, whatever happened the day they made Venus, they must have had a really bad day. I mean, if you were, if you tried to go through the clouds, the, the acid would eat you to pieces. I mean, if you were on the surface, you'd be pancaked. 
um because the pressure of the atmosphere is so high and you would also melt so because the temperature is hundreds of degrees higher and yeah there's two leading theories as to what happened uh one is that the sun just blasted away the the uh ocean's worth of water on venus and that's one of the things i was so beguiled about Vo venus used to be an ocean world whether it was for a million years or billions of years is almost kind of irrelevant in my head because it means that earth and venus were twins essentially at one point um, but the other theory is that you have these like epic volcanic eruptions that we've had on Earth, but only one at a time. I mean, million, multi-million year long e eruptions, you know, and uh, if you have a couple of those on Venus, you can kind of create a global warming runaway effect that, that even the planet can't like try and cool itself down. And Venus is basically what happens when climate change goes insanely out of control, you know, and it's a good, not so much a lesson for Earth, but it's the question of like, is Venus the normal thing uh, for like rocky planets the size or is earth a normal thing and so you know in the news you see like a new earth-like planet has been discovered blah 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 at the moment we can't tell scientists can't tell what's going on with that planet's atmosphere or anything so when they say earth-like they just mean it's rocky and it's about the same size as earth but it could be venus like you might it's the same thing venus is the same size it's made of the same stuff so but the reason there's so much interest in venus apart from the, that weird possibility there's life in the clouds is that it's like the exoplanet next door. If you can understand what happened to Venus and you understand what happened to what didn't happen to Earth, you can say, okay, is Earth, are Earth's more likely in the cosmos or are Venus is more likely in the cosmos? Did do volcanoes regularly assassinate their own their, their own planet or do they make it habitable? And basically, if you can answer that question, you've really got a handle on like how easy it is or not to create a habitable planet, which I think is one of the biggest questions you could possibly ask. So Venus really fascinates me. I think it's amazing. And you, know, you, you don't write about this in your book, but I'm kind of having this conversation makes me wonder about it. Uh, once we have large enough telescopes, maybe uh, telescopes that are out in space and can do spectroscopy mm -hmm. on some of these Earth-like planets and actually pick up the, with the frequency and wavelengths of the lights being uh, reflected off of those planets from their suns or sort of yeah. refracted around the edges of those planets. Uh, do you know whether we're going to be able to tell the composition of the atmosphere from that and, and draw some conclusions about volcanic processes on those planets? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, that's, yeah, absolutely. I mean, in, in, with things like the James Webb Space Telescope that everyone is so terrified will, <laughs> will, will <laughs> part of, these, part of these, these next generation observatories will we actually be able to see in some instances the, the light from the, these alien stars going through the atmosphere. And that way you can, you know, like a prism, work out what the atmosphere is made of. And then you'll be able to see, well, okay, well, this is Earth-like or Venus-like in that composition. So within the next couple of decades, all these exoplanets have been found. Some of them people will be like, okay, that, that one has a lot of oxygen on it. What does that mean? That one has a lot of, you know, carbon dioxide. Does that mean the volcano has kind of killed it? So we'll actually be able to categorize the likelihood of, oh, this planet is a hellhole like Venus, or this one is like, Earth. this one might be like Earth. So that's that's literally the next generation of telescopes. It's really exciting. I mean, you know, so, so well, yeah, that, no, that's, that's that the thing. Be, that could be another cool. book. That would, that would combine your interest in uh, space and volcanoes at the same time. <laughs> Oh, it'd be great. Yeah. If I, if I get to do, if I get to write, rearrange letters to write about volcanoes and planets and things for the next few decades, I'll be very happy. <laughs> okay. I got to ask you about moons then, because that's the yeah. other bizarre thing is these moons around Jupiter and maybe even Saturn that have volcanoes on them, but don't really have tectonic processes. So volcanoes can happen in other ways too. Yeah. So this, this may be my favorite thing ever, really, because I just think, again, it sounds like magic, is that when you have rocky worlds, the way you get things like volcanoes and tectonic activity, and basically the, the stuff that makes the surface happen and, and move, you know, where everything else is, um, you, you, you have two heat sources. One is that heat from the violent kind of formation where all these things are smacking together and generating heat and that kind of gets trapped inside and comes out in the form of, among, as among other things, volcanic eruptions. <clears throat> the other thing is you have radioactive material that over billions of years just decays and as it does, it releases heat. So that's how a place like Earth gets its heat and the moon and Venus like that. But <clears throat> there, it turns out that it might not even be the most common way of having things like volcanoes because around the moons, the moons of Jupiter and Saturn kind of thing, uh, before space probes got to them, scientists initially thought they'd just be dead little things because they're quite small. And so surely all their internal heat would have gone. But scientists started doing these predictions that, you know, these moons are orbiting around each other in such a sort of mathematically beautiful way. And they also orbit these giant planets, this giant gravitational pull that you'd get like really strong tides on them. And we have tides on the earth. Anyone who's seen the ocean knows what a tide is. The moon pulls at it. 
at, at the sea and you get, you know, uh, high tides and low tides. But it turns out that that effect can happen to such an extreme extent on other moons um, that you get tides in solid rock. So there's a moon called, called Io, uh, orbits Jupiter, and the surface moves up and down by like 300 feet every, every day um, because of the extreme gravitational force. And that creates a lot of heat. And that actually creates a hell of a lot of volcanoes. So on the one hand, you can get gravity powered or tide powered volcanoes that erupt, in this case, the hottest lava in the solar system. And then you have a moon like Enceladus, which is going around Saturn. And it's a very icy planet with an ocean world in it. And that actually erupts like a slurry of ice. So it has ice volcanoes. So it's on the complete other end of the scale. And this matter is erupting from Enceladus, getting sucked into the orbit of Saturn and is making one of the rings of Saturn called the E-ring, this really pristine ring. So a gravity powered volcano, uh, a gravity powered series of volcanoes on an icy moon is making one of the rings of Saturn, which again is a sentence that just sounds like witchcraft to me, but I love it. <laughs> well, and it's wild because I, I guess, um, I can't remember if you wrote about this, but I, I guess these uh, these gravitational processes could provide a source of energy that would uh, could cause uh, organic molecules to combine into life forms. <clears throat> right, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, it is, not to get too nihilistic, but it is the kind of ultimate fate of planets to eventually kind of die out. If, if the sun doesn't eat them first, then um, as it expands and, 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 and dies, um, it will run out of internal heat. So you'll start producing things like volcanic eruptions and moving tectonic plates, and you will stop making ocean basins and mountain ranges. If you have this sort of gravitational system where you constantly get tides, you have effect like an infinite source of heat and you, it, you wouldn't even need sunlight if you were like a life form living like under the, the crust. So when people have looked out into uh, exoplanets and they found that like, oh, you have an entire system of exoplanets, planets outside our, our um, solar system, you know, where they, they're all in this kind of gravitational dance with each other and probably generating a bit of heat. It almost doesn't matter what happens to the sun. I mean, their their star. You could have an endless, infinite source of heat that like transcends time, um, and wouldn't rely on anything else to kind of create it. So the fact that you have the, you could have tiny worlds that are still hot on the inside, that still have oceans for billions of years and longer than they should, it just kind of seems crazy to me that you would not have life somewhere <laughs> if you have this like infinite source of heat, which really is the thing that you know cooks up life uh, or the molecules responsible for life in the first place. So. Yeah, it's a beguiling yeah. thought. Yeah, no, yeah, we really got to go there and see if those these things are there. Uh, yeah. There's there's a couple of uh, there's a couple of questions uh, that that we've been asked. Um, Melanie writes, uh, you said that these academic journals accuse you of using flowery language, so you chose to write your book and sound so passionate in this presentation. Does it seem like oh, that's an interesting one? Does it seem like academia is purposefully leaving out a more general public audience that isn't in academia? Does that have a poor effect on the public and accessing or being interested in science information? Um, mm. that, that's a good yeah. one. I, yeah, it I, is I, a good. I, I mean, I, 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 I think. So. I mean, I know some wonderful scientists who are also very good at communicating the science. Like, some, it's a joy to speak to scientists who, who can put things in terms that are unsoundable to anyone. I think that's such a, a an amazing skill to have. Um, but a lot of scientists are almost discouraged from. From doing that kind of thing like it's seen as like a waste of a career like unless you're it's that whole publish or perish thing you have to get papers out you have to do this kind of thing you know and i know that academia in that sense is kind of generally underfunded anyway and it's not a good start but uh you know but it's yeah i think you're right really i mean that's partly what put me off academia is that it was seen as like a waste of time writing about this for people who weren't scientists and i don't really see how you're going to get people interested in science if it's seen to be so inaccessible on a on a on a just a linguistic level i mean we're humans are storytellers right i mean at the most basic thing what's the point in doing anything if you can't share the 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 amazing story of what you do with other people and, and to the point where i don't think a lot of scientists know what they do is is um is even that interesting to the public because it's such a it's such a narrow focus and the one thing i always think of is i was talking to a researcher about again the moon and they're like, oh, yeah, there was this little story about how they've done these calculations and found these strange glass beads on the moon. And all combined, it suggests that for about 70 million years, that very early on, the moon had an atmosphere uh, that could, was capable of like thunderstorms and rain and like weather. And I was like, hold on, th there was rain on the moon? And they're like, yeah, maybe for like 70 million years. And it was said it was such a casual, I mean, yeah, everyone in academia knows that. I'm like, no one outside of academia knows that. That's 
again amazing so yeah I think I think that's absolutely right you know I, I feel like I get why you have to write very clinically in scientific journals but I really wish scientists were given more of a chance to communicate their findings with the public because there's some amazing stuff out there that's just not being heard sort of thing so yeah I, I completely agree you know then again we don't want too many scientists who are communicating their ideas to the public because it doesn't leave room for you and me that's our job true. To, uh, true. Guy, there's, there's a middle ground there's a middle ground well, it's, it's 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 definitely very much an honor to, for people like us to be in that in that middle spot where we can it is great i mean it is a wonderful job and yeah you know and, and there's some ways and uh, scientists can synthesize a lot of information they routinely do in the classes that they teach but then again, you and I get to go in and learn everything there is to know about uh, science or everything, I mean, about volcanoes or everything there is to learn about plutonium and yeah. then turn around and write a book that uh, tries to convey that as a, in an accessible way to people. And, it's, you know, it's yeah. both very fun for us. And I think there, there is a role uh, for communicators like us mm. to bring, bring science to the public. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see the, the second question. Can you speak to the differences between the current volcanic eruption going on in Java, Indonesia, and the eruptions that have occurred recently in Iceland. Yeah, so so it does seem like this year there's been a lot of eruptions that I call socially significant. I mean, it's why they make the news, because they're happening near people. Um, and um, But the fact that you've got such different eruptions, like the one in Iceland, which has kind of temporarily petered out, was a very like effusive eruption. It, it It's kind of, Iceland is this weird place where you've got something called a mantle plume, which is coming up from like the Earth's heart, which is constantly heating a spot on the surface, creating a lot of magma. And it's also on the sort of sitting on the line of a tectonic divorce between the North American and Eurasian plates. So you've also got a supply of heat there, essentially. So Iceland is like this volcanic wonderland that also happened to you, very icy. Um, <clears throat> and the eruptions often in that part of Iceland, uh, very like lava uh, uh, prone, very effusive. And scientists kind of know that because it's just all the the rocks left over the, the kind of corpses of the other eruptions are all this kind of eruption so that's why you get that sort of eruption there what's happening in um indonesia is you know it's it's you often get explosive volcanoes in this part of the world and it's because it's, these volcanoes have a lot of trapped gas and if you have a lot of trapped gas um you know it's very much the analogy of the kind of you know coke bottle you got sh sh shook up sort of thing if you have all these bubbles wanting to come out all it takes is a little bit of uh, a little dent in the roof of this like, or you know the lid to be taken off but that's a, a, a flurry an explosive flurry so um that's why there's a difference but as for why they're happening roughly at the same time why these all these other options it's just a coincidence there's as i'm always at pains to point out there's always somewhere between 20 and 60 volcanic eruptions happening on land at any point uh during the day <laughs> like right now um the reason you haven't heard about most of those <clears throat> is because they're not happening near people so it's kind of like a um a perception thing that it seems like there's a lot going on at once but it's actually kind of normal it's just a coincidence that this year there's been a lot near people kind of thing but yeah they're always going to be quite different no matter where they turn up volcanoes are like cats they have they have the same laws of physics they have to abide by but um you know they erupt in very different ways <clears throat> you know i want to ask you just one last question it's about the very last chapter in your book where you Talk about volcanoes as sort of time machines where you can you can look at these processes over time. And, and I really like that having reached the end of the book, that book because you know books are sort of time machines too, in that you get yeah. to write down things and, and people can can read about these. So so what ways are volcanoes time machines? Well, so that volcanic rocks are the oldest things. I mean, they're the things that that appear first. And it, it kind of sounds weird. Like I'm not as a as someone who's trained as a, a, a volcanoist and everything, I'm not like particularly interested in like the rocks themselves, but more what they tell you sort of thing. So a lot of people can get really fascinated by like the grains and the crystals and things, and that's fine. But for me, it's like, it's 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 the overarching story of what they are that really interests me. And these rocks can be billions of years old. You know, when a planet first forms, it's first thing that happens is it's molten. And when that cools, you get volcanic glasses, volcanic rocks, and they preserve the conditions that were around at that planet at that time forever, essentially. So you have like, um, volcanic rocks that are like four and a half billion years old right to the creation of the planet to those that are just erupting right now kind of thing and it means that if you access these you're essentially opening up the story of this entire planet for the last few billions of years and again like you said like you know it's like books really books are like a form of time travel because it's you're hearing that person's thoughts on something from when it, when they wrote it which could be you know something that came out this year or something that came out 
2000 years ago you know and it's just about that idea of telling stories to just live in live in someone else's shoes or in this case walk across the surface of other planets you know as they were including our own as they were like billions of years ago and you can kind of project that to the future so to me like I know this book is about volcanoes but it's kind of a bit about time travel in that you know we only get to live once but thanks to this incredible part of science you could live billions of lifetimes you know across the stars and I think like there's no there's no more satisfying a storytelling mechanism than that I, <laughs> I think so yeah I mean volcanoes are creative and destructive at the same time but they also let you travel through time so what i couldn't resist writing about them <laughs> no it, it, it is really is fun yeah I'll, I'll never enjoy a book quite as much as writing about volcanoes yeah <laughs> Robin, i know it's almost two o'clock in the morning there in the uk so it's uh it must be a lot easier to do book talks on the east coast of the united states rather than the west coast of the united states where you have to stay <laughs> so late anyway oh, we, we certainly appreciate it I, I would never be able to do that myself oh it's all good no I, i'm a night owl i mean for what worries are other most of the people I write for uh, East Coast, sometimes West Coast, but I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely a night owl. If someone asks me to a book talk in the morning, impossible. <laughs> Always so, you know, each to their own. That, that'll be when the book comes out in Asia. Then you'll have to do book talks in the morning and wake up. That, yeah, then I, it's a sacrifice worth making. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, uh, that uh, those are the only questions I have. And I don't think we have, I'm just looking at the chat to make sure that none snuck in there. So uh, it looks like Kevin is back. Yes, and thank you both very much. And thanks everyone at home uh, watching tonight's event. I am going to put a link in the chat for our YouTube channel. Um, go ahead and check that out. Uh, this event will be showing up on that page probably sometime tomorrow. And you can see uh, all of our past events as well. Lots of great events that we've that we've hosted through Zoom in the last uh, year and a half. And um, we're very excited about tonight's event. Very interesting talk. Robin, thanks so much, uh, Super Volcano. Steve, thanks for uh, your, your help with this event tonight too. I'm also gonna post a link to Super Volcanoes once again in the chat. So click on that and order it from us here at Powell's. Um, Really great. I hope, uh, I hope we don't get any volcanic uh, activity here in the Northwest anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, hopefully not. Hopefully not. <laughs> All right. Thanks again, Steve and Robin and everyone else at home. And have a great night. Thanks. Thank you.